Hi, everyone, and welcome to Algebra and Resources live event today. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, their CEO, John Black, and we also have Chief Geological Officer Dr. Kevin B. Heather on the call. John and Kevin are going to be going through an update regarding their latest news, and after, we're going to be entering into a live Q&A session where you can ask questions. Please feel free to fill out any questions that you'd like in the chat found on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you'd like to get in contact with the Algebra and Management team, there's going to be a chat, uh, there's going to be a link in the chat going up. This event is being recorded. It's going to be available on demand on 6.com in the coming days. So look out for that if you want to refresh. But otherwise, John, I want to pass things over to you so that we can get started. Okay, well, great. Thanks, Cameron. And once again, thanks to SIX for providing this platform for us. Uh, today, what we want to do is update everybody on the drill hole we put out yesterday, hole 225B, which is one of the best drill holes we've, we've drilled to date at the Altar project. And we're continuing to demonstrate that the large uh, conductivity feature that we've been talking about is representing mineralization. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to, to Kevin and he'll walk us through the drill hole, the importance of it. And after that, we can come back and answer any questions that people might have. So why don't I pass it over to Kevin? Yeah, thanks, John, for the short introduction. And once again, thanks to the guys at SIX for organizing this. Uh, I think we've got some really exciting results. Uh, this is the kind of results that I think we thought we would be able to find uh, at this project. And uh, today we've got the uh, privilege of talking about what I think are going to be game changing uh, results. And, you know, the headline was 951 meters, a 0.6 copper equivalent. But what's really interesting is within that, there's still a very long interval of almost 645 meters of 0.7. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Kevin B. Heather. I'm the Chief Geological Officer of Aldebaran Resources. Many people out there know me as the Rock Doctor. And I'm going to take you through a typical technical um, overview very quickly of what 225B encountered and then uh, what the significance of that is moving forward. As we are a junior mining company on the venture exchange. Um, this is the typical disclaimer. Uh, for those that know me, um, I will be making some forward-looking statements. Uh, for those that might be new to the story, just a quick uh, location of where the project's at. We're located here in northwestern Argentina within San Juan province. San Juan province recently was rated the number one jurisdiction in the Fraser Institute's uh, analysis of places favorable for mining investment. And San Juan placed number one in all of South America. So it's a very good place to do business. And uh, right now it's undergoing somewhat of a copper boom uh, in that there's a lot of large copper projects that are actively being drilled and developed. And, and this has put a bit of a strain on getting access to drill rigs and to qualified uh, drill drillers and, and general supplies for, for the drill rigs. But um, that's slowly becoming uh, uh, less, of a, less of an issue here. And so what we can see is the Altar project is located down here in the western southwestern portion of san juan province uh, we're right up close to the border with chile and we're located about 25 kilometers north of the operating los palambres mine of antifagasta minerals on the chilean side and 25 kilometers north of the el pachon project uh, currently being developed by glencore and then about 50 kilometers uh, to the south of McEwen Copper's Los Azules project. Further to the north, uh, are where there's been quite a bit of news lately, is the Jose Maria and obviously the Filo del Sol projects in the northern part of San Juan. So a lot of activity. Just a quick review. Uh, we already have a very large resource in hand here at this project. Um, we, in 2021, we did an updated uh, mineral resource that only included the mineralization at Altar Central and Altar East. And you can see a significant amount of copper here, almost close to uh, 13 billion pounds of copper divided up as 
6.1 billion pounds of copper in the measured category, another 5.3 billion pounds of copper in the indicated category, and then a lesser amount down here in the inferred category, and then a significant amount of gold and silver as well. And you can see that that's all constrained within this pit shell that's only centered on the Altar Central and the all Altar East ore bodies. You can see that below Altar Central and below Altar East, there are drill holes that are very well mineralized that are currently not in the resource. In addition, three kilometers further to the west, we have the radio QDM porphyry system where we have done an extensive drilling, but this is currently not in resource and would likely go into resource when we decide to do an updated resource for the entire project. One of the things I'll point out to you, which is the focus of this year's drilling, is you'll see that the pit has this very uh, noticeable hump in the bottom of it. And that's really because there's no drilling that's deeper than about three or 400 meters in this central area. And in some places, there's absolutely no drilling. And so this becomes an area of what if, what if there was something there? And so just to so sort of talk about where we left off from the last webinar we did, which was in May 11th, um, when we released hole 224, we can see that the project has um, a number of shallow drill holes. Um, you can see the pit outline here again. This is an east-west section looking towards the north. And you can see that there's this similar hump. And in last year, we drilled hole 221, and that hit a long run of mineralization. Uh, before that, we drilled hole 212 a few years ago, and that also hit a very long run of, of, of decent mineralization. And then this year, we've released two holes prior to the release that went out yesterday. Um, hole 223, again, hit almost over a kilometer of almost 0.5 copper equivalent. And then hole 224 that hit uh, 770 meters of 0.55 copper equivalent. And so you can see that I've superimposed this on this very large 3D magnetotelluric or MT anomaly, which is showing us conductivity or resistivity, but here it's showing us that it's low resistivity so that it's actually a very conductive body. And you can see that there is a fairly good correlation of that anomaly with some of these long mineralized intercepts. And I'll also point out to you that you can see that there's some very good mineralization be just below the current pit shell that again has this little hump in the bottom of it. So the concept of this year's drilling was to focus on trying to test this geophysical anomaly. And the hole that we released yesterday, hole 225B, was designed to test this gap area, which was 400 meters between drill hole 223 and 224. Before we get to look at some of the rocks and look at the results, uh, I just wanna pay a little bit of attention to some of the quotes that were in the press release from yesterday, because those normally capture what we're thinking and, and, and where our excitement about moving the project forward are. And in John's quote, he says that this represents one of the best holes ever completed on the Altar project, both in terms of grade and length. And I think that's significant. And that clearly previous drilling on the project was merely scratching the surface of what's shaping up to be an extremely large copper system. And in my quote, I pointed out that Really, hole 225B, like I just mentioned, infills a 400 meter gap between the previous holes we just released this year, 223 and 224, both of which had long runs of very attractive grades. But this hole 225B further confirms that there is continuity on a large scale within this new mineralized zone that we're coining the name Altar United, because we feel that this is occurring along a west-northwest to east-southeast trend, and that this 
mineralization that we're defining now during this year's campaign is really starting to unify the Altar Central Center of Mineralization with the Altar East uh, Center of Mineralization and creating one large ore body. And the significance of Hole 225 in addition is, is that it's, like John mentioned in his quote, one of the best holes ever drilled, both in terms of grade and length. And therefore, we think we might have found a hot spot within the larger system, which is significant. So just a location map to show where the holes are. You can see these are color coded. So the holes that we've previously reported are 222, 223, 224, and 226. This release, we're releasing hole 225B, which is located here. We've got five holes that are complete, but are pending their final assays in QA, QC. And we currently have four holes active that you can see here, 229, 124 extension, and 232 and 233. I'd now just like to show you a north-south cross section and we'll be looking towards the east. And so here we can see, looking towards the east, we can see on this section very limited previous drilling, very shallow previous drilling. And we can see the uh, conceptual 2021 pit shell here in gray. And we can see hole 225B uh, here showing with the copper equivalent grades. And we can see that that intercepted a long run of over a kilometer of 0.56 copper equivalent dominated by copper. But within that is a, a sub interval of 951 meters of 0.6 copper equivalent. Again, dominantly copper. And then more interesting, I think, from the perspective of finding a hot spot is that there was a very long intercept of a much higher grade mineralization, uh, 645 meters of 0.7 copper equivalent um, within a slightly larger interval of 717 meters of 0.68 copper equivalent. So really encouraging stuff. And you can see how this sits just below the pit shell. If I superimpose now the 3D magnetotelluric or MT resistivity anomaly, you can see that it's center punching that anomaly. This is the chargeability. And for those of you that have been following us and following some of my previous webinars, you'll know that typically these high chargeability areas are more dominated by pyrite and they represent the peripheral parts of the system. But we need to be careful because we are in a system where we do have multiple overprinting porphyry systems, and therefore we could get some interference patterns. This is showing the in-pit resource block model from 2021. And so you can see that where we've hit this very good mineralization is completely out of the current resource and outside of the current pit shell. So now I would just like to quickly take you through what some of the rocks look like in this hole and point out some of the important features and why we're excited about this hole. To start with, this hole was collared in porphyry intrusion that had very strong quartz veining right from the very start, which is very intriguing and in that the porphyry here appears to have come to the surface or at least been eroded down to the to the part where we're actually in the porphyry intrusion and not in the wall rocks. And you can see that the, the quartz veining here is very strong and the rock is just shattered with uh, quartz veining. And this part of the hole has undergone oxidation. We also see some interesting types of quartz veins that are very important for us as explorationists. And you can see these quartz veins have very irregular uh, boundaries and appear to be intergrown with the porphyry intrusion. These are probably magmatic quartz veins. And these give us an idea that a lot of this quartz is actually pre precipitating directly out of the magma and that some of the mineralization, this may be the parental 
porphyry intrusion that's bringing in at least part of the mineralization. But as we'll see, there is strong evidence that we may have a superposition of another mineralizing event on top of this earlier mineralization. You can see again that in this upper part, and again, for reference, you'll see over here on the drill hole, these green stars. These green stars show you the locations of where the photos come from approximately. And you can see the strong leaching here where the copper and the sulfides have been leached out and have left behind iron oxides. A little bit deeper down and when the grade starts to pick up, we start to see the deposition of calcasite. Calcasite, in this case, is a secondary copper mineral. And for those that, again, have been following some of my webinars, you'll know that calcasite um, has 82% copper in its crystal structure. So uh, when we start to see this mineral, we know that the grades are going to jump up. And so here we can see calcasite as secondary mineral um, that's been leached out, the copper has been leached out from above and has come down and is now precipitating on pyrite and calcopyrite. We also see some interesting cross-cutting relationships that although look very subtle and not important, they are very critical to unraveling the story here at Altar. And here we can see the porphyry intrusion with quartz veining and we can see another porphyry intrusion come in and cross-cutting and truncating the quartz vein. And then that porphyry is actually cross-cut by another generation of quartz veins. So what this shows us is that we've got multiple intrusions and multiple different phases of veining and copper mineralization. We also see that some of these early quartz veins again, have very irregular forms. And here we can actually see these very, very well-developed crystal terminations of quartz. These are probably USTs or unidirectional solidification textures. And those are important because those tell us that we're near the top of a potential mineralizing uh, magma body. And you can see that that's been cross-cut by later sulfides and those later sulfides are probably related to a superimposing additional second event that, that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. You can see that the, the porphyry intrusion here, again, very well strongly veined with uh, quartz and strongly altered as well. As we go a bit deeper and as we start to come into where the grades start to pick up, we start to see the presence of um, these green sericite halo style uh, alteration that carry very, very strong calcopyrite. In this case, it's carrying almost 7% calcopyrite. So that particular halo is probably running 2 to 3% copper. Um, and so when we start to see these increase in their density and they start to uh, merge together, that's when we start to see uh, uh, longer runs of, of higher grade mineralization. And I'll show you that in a few minutes here. You can see that when we look in those green sericite halos, we see abundant calcopyrite. There is some pyrite in here as well, but it's dominated by calcopyrite, which is the bright yellow mineral in here. We also see another mineral, magnetite, associated with both calcopyrite quartz, and there's also some lavender or purple colored and hydrite in here. And that mineral assemblage in veins is very typical of potassic alteration. Um, and that's a good sign that we're into a, a, a productive system here. We can also see that when we don't have that overprint of the green sericite with calcopyrite, the rock is still well, relatively well mineralized. And here we can see the porphyry intrusion. We can see all these black spotted areas and that's secondary biotite or uh, potassic alteration that's altering this intrusion. And you can't really see it uh, in this photo, but there's a lot of fine disseminated calcopyrite in this rock. 
And so the background potassic alteration is also bringing in a fair bit of calcopyrite or copper. And then that's being superimposed by this green sericite event that's bringing in even more calcopyrite and copper. And here's an example where you can see that overprinting actually happening. You can see we're at about 700 meters depth here, and we can see this very strong secondary biotite, uh, we call shreddy biotite here in the, in the intrusion that does have calcopyrite associated with it. And you can see that it's clearly overprinted by this veinlet of biotite and calcopyrite and magnetite with green sericite halo that's full of uh, calcopyrite as well. And also you can see that it's texturally destroying this porphyritic texture that was there before with the potassic alteration. Just another example showing the same phenomenon. And so when we start to see these types of green sericite halos start to uh, converge and, and form a more massive rock, such as this, we can see here now that there's virtually no porphyritic texture. You can see just ghosts of that original porphyry texture. Uh, and now this rock is running anywhere between two or three percent calcopyrite. And again, remember that calcopyrite has about 33 percent copper in its crystal structure. So that means uh, 3% calcopyrite translates to 1% copper in the rock. And so again, this is uh, where we're starting to now get into this higher grade interval of all over uh, 645 meters of 0.7 copper equivalent is when we're starting to see now that these green sericite halos are starting to coalesce and completely obliterate that original uh, potassic shreddy biotite type alteration that was also mineralized as well. Just another example. And here again, you can see we're still seeing strong quartz veining and this very, very strong uh, uh, green sericite with a lot of sulfide uh, obliterating um, the original porphyry texture. And this goes on for this entire segment of this higher grade mineralization. Here's another one from further down the hole. We're almost at a kilometer depth here. And we can see that this is running um, roughly 3% calcopyrite. You can see the original rock texture completely destroyed. And this would be running uh, close to 1% copper. And again, we can see from a core box photo, the same phenomenon where we just get little windows where we can see that earlier shreddy potassic alteration uh, with the biotite. And for the most part, it's being completely obliterated by the coalescence of these green sericite halo style mineralization. And just another example, again, to just hammer home the point that this is a long interval of this very strong green sericite type uh, calcopyrite uh, alteration. Uh, in some systems, these are known as early, uh, early um, micaceous uh, veins or EDM veins. Um, and so this is very interesting uh, to start seeing these in such abundance. And we're also starting to see with depth, we're seeing calcopyrite and uh, the molybdenite grades are, are starting to pick up as well. And then the hole ended in a mix of porphyry dikes and went out into wall rock of andesitic character. But the grades are still fairly good. The last 20 meters was still in little over 0.5 copper equivalent. Um, but we terminated the hole um, because we got to a depth where we wanted to move on to make sure that we got other holes drilled before the end of the, the field season. So... What does this all what does this all mean? Well, it's getting much bigger, and I would suggest that we're starting to see higher grades as well. And so if we go back to our diagram again of the drill hole, now I'd like to take you and show you a west to east cross section. So we'll be looking towards the north. And so here we are. Again, we can see our conceptual pit outline here in the gray line. We can see the historic drilling and some of the drill holes that we've previously reported. This is the current 
2021 block model. So this is the material that's currently reporting to our resource. And again, you can see that all of these deeper holes are encountering very good mineralization immediately below the current pit bottom. And you can see again, this pit's got this kind of funny hump in it. And that was because there was no drilling here before. And you can see now I've superimposed that large conductivity feature from the magnetotelluric resistivity survey. And you can see those holes and you can see the grades. You can see hole 212, again, 1.4 kilometers, a 0.53 copper equivalent. Hole 221, over a kilometer, a 0.4. Hole 223, released earlier this month or earlier this year, I should say, in March, uh, over a kilometer of 0.48. And hole 224. Uh, 670 meters, a 0.55, ended in strong mineralization. And I think the thing to look at here is that the separation still between these holes is very big. The distance between these two holes is over 700 meters. There are holes currently being drilled to start to address that area. Um, we can see that the distances between these holes is still 200 meters. Um, which suggests that we've got really good continuity over a very large area. And um, typically, if for, even for porphyry systems, these are big step outs. This is an oblique view that we've used on many of our previous webinars. And you can see we're now looking towards the southeast. You can see our camp location here in the upper part of the figure. And we've done a slice through here. Again, you can see the 2021 conceptual pit outline. And you can see all the holes from this year's campaign. And you can see the location of where 225B is. And I think you can see that there's still areas with very large gaps that need to be filled in on this, uh, on this anomaly. So where are we at? As of yesterday, May 31st, we had four rigs currently drilling. We've currently completed a little over 14,000 meters of drilling. The production has really picked up since we brought in our drill specialists and we started working more closely with our drill contractor. The uh, production rates have really uh, picked up and we're still not where we need to be, but we're much, much better than where we were uh, a few months ago. So that's good news. So we've now reported five holes, 222, 223, 224, 226, and then yesterday's release of the spectacular hole 225B. We currently have five holes that have been completed, uh, but all of these holes still have segments of the holes that are pending final assays in QAQC. But I suspect that we should be releasing some additional holes here very shortly. And we currently have four holes active, hole 229, 231, and 232, and just recently moved a rig over to two, pad 233, but this hole may not get very far before we have to shut down for the winter season. And here you can see the locations in blue of those active, active holes, and in magenta, the location of the holes that are complete but are still pending assays, and then the location here of hole 225B. So just a quick mention the altar on all where we're at, the season end is approaching. These are photos from a few days ago where we got hit by a snowstorm. You can see the drill rigs here uh, drilling towards the evening hours with lit up and um, uh, the roads starting to get covered with snow. Uh, we had to shut the rigs down for almost a day, almost two days, because we had to clean the roads. Uh, small vehicles could get to the rigs, but the big water trucks were having trouble. So, but we're back drilling again with all four rigs. Um, you can see a shot here of the project up in the background here, and here's in camp with the snow. Um, but there is some more snow forecast to come um, this weekend, and so we'll see, uh, but so the, the drilling will really be um, uh, 
depend on really what the what the weather comes here. And we're at that point in the season where um, we have to be very careful. We don't want to get equipment trapped up the hill. And more importantly, we want to make sure that everybody gets uh, home safely. Um, we know that some of our projects around us have already commenced to demobilize for the winter as well. So this will probably be happening, but we're going to try to push through as far as long as we possibly can. So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention, and uh, we'd like to open it up to uh, questions and answers. Thanks. Great, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, just as a reminder to everyone in the audience, now that we're entering into the Q&A portion of today's event, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat found on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, John, uh, we do have questions that have already come in. So let's dive right in, though. Jorge wants to know, in the past, you've reiterated on multiple occasions that the limit at which you intended to drill was 1200 meters because it was the typical depth of an open pit of this type. Uh, and he sees that in hole 229, you have over 1400 meters. Can we, the audience, relate this with the search for this hotspot that you mentioned in the press release? Uh, great question. And, and one I need to be a little bit careful about how I answer because we don't want to give any information on visuals and drill holes or, or things like that. But as we approach the end of the season, we, we evaluate how we can best use our drilling, whether we start a new hole or whether we continue to get a little more information on some holes. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that we wouldn't extend holes beyond that 1200 meters unless we're seeing something of interest to us. And that could be either uh, grade that we're following to, to watch on that. We could be looking for a contact of the intrusive. There are a number of, of reasons that we might go deeper on, on a hole like this, but uh, most of those would be because it's an interesting hole. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Terrence has a couple of questions. The first is this, uh, when does drilling begin again in San Juan? Uh, and his, uh, I'll let you answer that first. Okay. What we anticipate on this, we, we never know exactly how the winter will be. And the winters here, the issue is more when the snow falls, it doesn't go away. And so it blows around. You can plow your road out and the next day, the wind drifts back in. And at some point, it just becomes inefficient to continue to drill. There, the Los Palombres mines operates all year at this level as a, as a mine operation. But for expiration, it just becomes inefficient for a few months. We anticipate that we'll go back into the camp in September, and we plan to be drilling by October. Okay, great. And the second part of Terrence's question is just what, when will the resource come into full view uh, in, in regards to a broad timeline? Um, as Kevin presented, we can see that this year we'll, we'll complete uh, between 12 and 14 of these longer holes at approximately a 200 meter spacing. And already we've seen the results that confirm that the, there's this remarkable coincidence with the geophysical anomaly, the conductivity anomaly, and, and good grade mineralization. So we're, we're confirming that the large deposit is there beneath us. We're getting as much drilling as we can into to begin to see the dimensions on that. We will be able to do an internal um, resource estimate on that ourselves. Um, and if we feel that that's a significant jump in the mineralization style, we'll commission a, an independent report to give a, a, a resource update, which would be towards the end of this calendar year but will be by no means um, to the point where we can show the full size of the deposit. That will require one more full season of drilling. So we anticipate a, a potential interim resource update late this year, uh, followed by the full season of drilling from September uh, or October to start drilling through to about June of 2024. And then by the time we complete that in the, the latter half of 2024, we believe we'll be in a position to show the full size of the Altar United um, deposit. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, Ward has a, a question here. If, just if you have any general comments on the market, essentially, uh, he, he comments that not much seems to be moving the needle these days. We are, um, and, and these are just my, my comments on the market. I by no means have a crystal ball on this, but uh, there is um, kind of a, a, a lull right now where we, uh, there's very general consensus that the, that copper will become in, in a severe shortage effectively as demand continues to increase and our industry is not capable of, of putting on enough new production to cover that. And so there, the outlook for copper prices 
and the medium to long term are, are very positive and, and we'll very likely see a strong increase in copper. And that's that's well recognized by by everyone in the in the business. But um, in the short term, there still remain concerns about globally how we'll handle inflation and how we'll keep things under constraint. There's been a little bit of concern about uh, issues within the U.S. on spending caps and things like that. I think that's been resolved this week. So I, I think we'll see continued softness, perhaps for the, the remainder of this year even. But by the end of this year, and particularly into next year, I anticipate we'll be into a very robust copper market. So this creates a heck of an opportunity for those of you that are following the copper space to put some chips on the table on good copper projects like what we're talking about today. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, this next question is this. Uh, to what extent could this season's drill results contribute to resource growth, uh, especially in terms of how much the tonnage increases and economics improve? We have to be careful. We're not allowed to to present information on this, but I think you can just do some rough calculations on taking a look at this. We're we're indicating um, five, six, seven hundred meters of additional mineralization beneath the pit, and we're, we've now demonstrated that over a strike length of of one point two kilometers with some gaps in there, but 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 still pretty good confidence that those will fill in. So the you can do just off the sections that Kevin's presented, you can give some some rough calculations of the potential volume. Now, of course, we have to float a pit and see how much of that's captured in a pit versus what might have to be chased after with uh, with you know potentially bulk underground mineable scenarios for the higher grade portions. So there's there's a lot lot to go on it, but it's it's a very significant increase. I would refer to um, um, the the initial report that was put out by Desjardins, um, by John Jonathan Igilo, who covers us with Desjardins, he noted that if our drilling continues to have the type of success we have, the potential exists to double the resource. And I don't see any reason to disagree with that based on, on the information that we're putting out. Okay, cool. Another question from uh, Nitram. You seem to have success with opening up old drill holes. Can you touch on what this means in terms of money and time saved? Ah, good question. I, I don't think we mentioned that, but you'll note that a couple of the holes are, are denominated with an EXT on the end. That's an extension hole. So in over much of the deposit area, we actually have 100 meter space drilling. It's just not very deep. And um, we, what we realized is that in some of these holes, we can re-enter those holes and we start drilling from, say, four or 500 meters depth, the original drill hole depth of the hole, and we extend it. So it saves us time and saves us four or 500 meters worth of cost on the top of the hole as well. So we can't enter every single hole, but we've, we've had success getting into several of those. One challenge we have on that is all of the, or virtually all of the previous drilling was vertical and we prefer to incline our holes a little bit. It gives us better control on the vein types and the, and the intrusive contacts, which tend to be vertical. But we'll, we'll do a mix of that. So it's both a, a cost and a time savings. It'll probably allow us to get one or two extra holes this year. Right, understood. Okay. Uh, this next question is, could you tell us about the new copper board in San Juan and what it aims to achieve? Okay, I think I think what the, the, the question is referring to is, is actually the, the new Mesa de Cobre or, or copper round table or copper board that's been set up nationally. This is something that's been set up by CAIM, which is the national um, uh, mining group. Uh, in coordination with the Secretary of Mines federally as well, has set up a, a group of those of us that are working on large copper deposits to interact with the governments and authorities at both federal and provincial levels and develop ways that mining can be, uh, particularly copper mining, can be promoted and developed for the benefit of, of everyone in Argentina. So it's a very good initiative. It's uh, We participate in it along with about seven other companies that are all working on large copper deposits. And the type of, this has just really been set up in the lot. We've had our first couple meetings to date on this, and it's really being set up so that we can provide um, government officials, and in this case, uh, potential new government officials. Remember, we have a presidential election coming up in October. And so we'll be interacting with, with all potential parties to demonstrate the importance of mining and what mining can do to help improve the economy of Argentina uh, for the benefit of everyone in Argentina. And we're, we're receiving very good reception from this. Uh, the politicians are, are anxious to know more about this. There's, there's very wide support across all political parties, really, for, for improving uh, the mining, or for developing the potential for a establishment of a true mining industry in Argentina. It's, it's remarkably refreshing. Most, most areas of the world, we kind of fight against 
uh, perception of mining and it, and right now the the door is wide open for us to develop so they're asking what do we need to attract investment what needs to be changed and, and i believe it's a sincere sincere effort on their part and we're providing good feedback to it so it's it's quite exciting we started as a as a similar group just within san juan province and now it's expanded to a national level right okay okay um why do you think that the market isn't giving you the valuation that these drill results potentially deserve, especially compared to other copper explorers in San Juan? I know you may have touched on this, but uh, just any uh, other color that you might be able to add? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> it's because it's we can see so, so much opportunity on this project and we, you know, we think it's just an outstanding opportunity for people to come in and make an, an early investment on this before things take off. There are a number of other good projects, but some of our peers have great projects but they tend to have uh, much higher market caps. They're, they're, they've been realized effectively and discovered. So we believe that we have a lot of people watching the project. I think everybody in these kind of doldrums or slightly uncertain times are waiting things for, for takeoff. So we believe that with the type of results that we're putting out on this, that we will attract those investments as tight as our share structure has it. We're likely to move rather quickly when it happens. And uh, that we'll, we, we think we have people lined up to do that. It just needs that trigger. I think a whole like what we delivered today and we will have several more press releases over the next few weeks and months that I think will continue to deliver similar information. I, I think it's that will eventually be the catalyst to have people realize the full potential on this project. Okay, great. Uh, why do you think that South 32 was interested in the project and what has the working relationship with, uh, with them been like so far? Um, I can't speak entirely on behalf of all the, their internal things, but the working relationship's been fantastic. We we knew that when they approached us uh, with interest in making a strategic investment to us, that they were well viewed as good partners. We talked to a lot of our peers. They have agreements with with many companies uh, like us, and and they they all speak highly of them. And we can certainly confirm that they've been very good partners to work with. They're very interactive. They they don't uh, drive things or make decisions for us, but they provide us with good input on moving forward. And that's partly the nature of the, the, the agreement that we've structured with them too, so that we, we can maintain that independence from, from them going forward. Um, I can point out that South 32, for those that may not know it, is a, is a company that was spun out of BHP. And, and BHP essentially they realized they had a number of operations that didn't fit their, their strategic objectives overall. And they, they carved out a new company, uh, South 32, that held kind of the the, the, the extra bits that didn't fit in. So these would be coal mines or, or um, alumina mines or things that weren't their main course. And there was not very much copper in South 32 when it came out. But South 32's had embarked on a very dedicated effort to increase the amount of copper that they have going forward. They recently purchased a, a large portion of an operating mine, uh, Sierra Gorda, in Chile. So they're an established producer in Chile. They, in addition to our agreement in San Juan province, they have agreements with two of our peers on earlier stage projects in San Juan. They're, they're very interested in Argentina overall and, and particularly the San Juan province. And they're, they're clearly looking for, for increasing their copper exposure worldwide. So we fit very well into that strategy and, um, and they're, they're quite pleased with the results that we're producing. Keep in mind, they, they entered into that agreement as a strategic placement prior to any of these deep holes into the new anomaly, prior to us even showing the new conductivity anomaly. So they're, they're, all of this new information just confirms why they, they entered into the project with us. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, another question, what would you say to people that are waiting for a recession before they commit to investing? <laughs> it's, uh, I'd say first, I'm not an economist and, and, I, and I can't predict uh, emotional moves and how things go for on this it um it's 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 possible there's there's certainly some some challenges economically worldwide right now on how we rein in inflation and how things go there there are a lot of moving things politically throughout the world um if if my own opinion is that if if one were to come or 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 be more clear in the coming months on this it's probably going to be short-lived and and over rather quickly um, I, we, our first company, Antares Minerals, we, we, had, we were in a similar situation with a great project in 2008. Uh, everything was humming along and the global financial crisis came and the bottom of the world dropped out. 
Uh, but 18 months after the bottom of that, everything was roaring and coming right back. And we, we sold the project for, for $650 million. So these type of events um, it can certainly happen. You should be prepared to have cash on these. But um, timing the bottom of it or, or knowing when we're coming out is always difficult to say. But uh, clearly right now, it's a fantastic time to position investments into copper stories. Uh, one of ours being, I think, a very good opportunity for that. There are many others as well. But I think it's a great time to be coming in. And if you if you wait too long to pick that very bottom or for where it'll start, these things can move very rapidly when they come up. And you'll you'll find yourself like I have found myself many times investing in, in junior companies is I saw it, I knew about it, and I missed it because it moved too fast on me. So I'd, I'd uh, look for good stories, good management, good um, locations of the projects moving forward. And, and take advantage of, of things being a little bit choppy right now and a little bit depressed on prices. It's the perfect time to enter into the market. Okay, great. Adrian, would just like to, uh, if you could provide an overview of any infrastructure that's near the site. Certainly. Um, the, we, we are right along the border of Argentina, Chile, in the, in, in the, in the high Andes. So at first you would you take a, a, a quick look and say this might look pretty remote, but keep in mind 25 kilometers away from us, is the, the large operating Los Palamares mine. So there's there's power, there's water, there's everything established to, to 25 kilometers away from us on the Chilean side of the border. Uh, we're also only about 100 kilometers away from the Pacific coastline, uh, also dropping off through Chile on that. And then on the Argentine side, one of the, the big advantages that we will have on our project area is that we share the same access road with the Pachon project, Glencore's large project that's 25 kilometers to the south of us on the Argentinian side, just across the border from Los Palambres. So there's an excellent opportunity to share our infrastructure um, in, in terms of pathways for power coming into the project if it has to come in solely from the Argentinian side, which, which would be a consideration. So uh, remote, but certainly not, not impossible. Elevation of the project is, uh, the top of the project is 4,200 meters. Our camp at the base of the project is about 3,100 meters. That's about 1,000 meters lower than many of the other projects that are in the Andes that are, exist as operating mines. Veladero operates at elevations well over well over 4,000 meters throughout the year. So it's it's um, it, it's not as, as daunting as it might appear when you first take a look at the project. No, oh, fair enough. Well, listen, John, I want to thank you for coming on today. I want to thank Kevin for giving you the great presentation. That looks like all the questions that we've received for today so far. Uh, of course, I want to thank everyone who's joined us live, especially those who have asked questions. But before we wrap up the day, John, I want to pass things over to you for any closing remarks that you might have. Okay, well, great. Thanks, Cam. And, and once again, uh, thank you to, for your team for providing this format. We hope it's a, a way that we can get information out. If you think of questions afterwards or we didn't get to your questions, please let us know. There are numerous ways you can contact us. There's a lot of information on our website, and Kevin puts out a, a whole series of videos like this walking everyone through the technical importance of the, the projects we have. And um, more than anything else, stay tuned. There's a lot of a lot of additional information to come. We've only released five holes from this drill campaign. We we've got uh, another eight or nine to come over the coming weeks and months, and we're quite excited about those. And we we look forward to being able to talk to you again in this type of format. So, um, thank thanks everybody for your attention, and and look forward to to being in contact with you. Mm -hmm.